morning, everybody. I just realized I'm walking across over here. Yeah, I didn't. I know I've been gone for five Lord's Days, but I was thinking I, I just was here. Well, because I was here on Wednesday. Uh, so, but I haven't seen most of you for because of being gone for four, four, five Sundays or something. I guess whatever. Got back from Vietnam and I went to uh, Lancaster family camp. Uh, so it's good to be back. Um, and it was a good trip to Vietnam. It was just Bach and myself went in uh, mostly uh, Bible study, not humanitarian work. If we, We'll do that maybe later in the year. Um, so I did studies with, I don't know, 60-some people in three different locations, uh, from Hanoi all the way in the north, uh, to Kanto all the way in the south and Vung Tau which is kind of in the middle of the country on the ocean uh, that was a bigger meeting there and it was good and covered a lot of material uh, many of the people of course I know over the years some new people all in all it was was good it was hot I think when I landed in Saigon it was like a hundred and two course it's humid <laughs> there as well so so sometimes the environment can be challenging and uh, those people never cease to amaze me they sit right on a tile floor cross-legged which I couldn't do under any circumstances I couldn't sit cross-legged on a carpeted floor uh, but they sit right there they use the floor as their table. They all got tablets. They're taking notes, and they'll sit there for hours. And I cannot. Uh, they stick me in a wooden chair, uh, harder than rock, and I'm squirming around. I can't sit still. I got to stand up. So <laughs> they're amazing to me how they do that. And uh, so it was good. So we had a great trip, got back, I don't know, a couple weeks ago on Sunday, I guess. And so, good to be here. I want to challenge us today. Something I was thinking about, and I thought, you know, really it's kind of amazing in a way. Uh, Jerry's not here, but I know this is always one of his favorite passages. It's John 17, and, and I think verse 3 here. Uh, and this is eternal life, Jesus says, that they may know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Talk about putting something right in a nutshell. Jesus identifies, ultimately, what is eternal life, is that they know you. You know God. You know God the way God intended that we would know him. You are going to heaven. It's eternal life. And to know the one whom he sent, Jesus Christ whom he sent. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one getting to the Father except through him. If you know him and the way that God intended and the way that we can, you're going to live forever. Wow. Wow. Now, this is quite the prayer, the high priestly prayer, John 17, because this is right before he's taken and crucified. He knows he's done. In fact, that's what he tells him. Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. Glorify your son. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And he says, I have manifested, verse 6, the name, your name to the men whom you have given to me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. They've kept your word. I have given them the word that you've given me. I'm no longer in the world, verse 11 says, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. I'm coming home. Thank you. 
I like this passage here. In verse 5, I read past it. Now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Wow. The glory I had with you before there ever was a world. I came down here, I accomplished the mission, and I'm coming home. Eternal life is to know him the way he intended and the way that we can and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. In Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, one of them, a lawyer, was questioning him in verse 35, testing him, saying, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and said the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments, saying all the law and the prophets. Obviously, he's quoting out of the uh, Ten Commandments. No, actually, that is not the Ten Commandments. It's after the Ten Commandments, now that I correct myself. Loving God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your neighbors yourself is the royal law. It's not in the Ten Commandments. Interesting. But it says that the royal law fulfills the covenant law, which is the Ten Commandments. It's superior. You keep the two, you fulfill the ten, is what Paul says at the end of Romans 13. Loving God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, some say your heart, same thing. First and great commandment. But in Big John, what we see no one has seen this God. Big John 1 and 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him or explained him. Jesus is the Word, the Logos, the communication of God to mankind. Now, Jesus himself would say in Big John 5 and 37, The Father himself who sent me testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. He would say in John 16, 45 and 46, it's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from me or learned from the Father comes to me. Remember Jesus said, no one can come to me unless my Father draw him. There in, at the end of John 6. What am I misquoting myself here? Big John 6. Oh, sorry, folks. Well, I was just checking to see if you were paying attention. Big John 6, verse 45, it's written in the prophecy, it shall all be taught by God, therefore everyone is heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen. The Father. He's already made the point. No one has ever seen God. Ever. No one, Exodus 33, can see my face and live, is what God told Moses. No one has ever seen him. Yet, to know him 
and the way he intended and the way that we can, in a nutshell, you're going to heaven. You'll live with God forever. It's eternal life. Knowing him and the one whom he sent, his son, Jesus Christ. How in the world can you know somebody that you can love now with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, never heard him, his voice, never seen his shape, but you can. And I like how First Peter one puts the speaking of Jesus, which is the same thing. In First Peter chapter 1, we have this hope of eternal life reserved in heaven for us in verse 3. First Peter 1 and 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away, reserved in heaven for you, got your name on it, who are then kept by the power of God through our faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Remember receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Verse 9 there, jumping ahead. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you're grieved with various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, even though tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen. You know, those guys, that little short window period of time who actually walked with him, handled him, literally heard his voice, Jesus I'm talking about. Most people did not, even in his day, they did not. Whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, still, you ain't gonna see him now, didn't see him before, you ain't seeing him now, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. Really? You haven't seen him, yet you love him to the extent that you love him so much you have a joy that you cannot even express. I think I don't know that anybody's ever experienced anything that they love that much. You know, that you can't even put it into words. And rejoicing, even though you're grieved, going through various trials, if need be, because it's a testing of your faith. How is this even possible? It makes no sense at all. It's eternal life. Father, this is eternal life, that they know you. One only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Live forever. You know, in Genesis 5 and 24, it says Enoch walked with God, but he never saw him. Genesis 9, uh, 6, 9 said Noah was a just man and he walked with God and perfect in his ways. James reminds us in James 2 and 23, Abraham was actually referred to in Scripture as the friend of God. You know, that sounds like it's getting kind of personal. To walk with somebody, to be their friend. Can you imagine that? The whole, the creator of the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in it wants to be your friend. Stephen, right before they killed him, well, actually, no, that's Acts 7. Acts 13 is when Paul gives his little history lesson to the Jews, reminding them that God said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will accomplish all my will. Man, to have God say about you by name, he has found you to be a man or a woman, 
after his own heart. Can we know him that way? Can we have that kind of a personal relationship? God says, I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters. Don't you think the children ought to know who the father is? You know, he knows us. Oh, the Bible's clear. Knew you before you were born. Knows how many hairs are on your head. Knows when a bird falls out of the tree in your yard. Why do they need to know that? I don't know. Didn't say he need to know it. Just said he did know it. And every idle word you've ever spoken. He knows that too. He looks down from heaven from his dwelling place and he sees all the sons of men. And you know, ladies, you know, that means mankind includes the loities and fashions the hearts individually. Oh, he knows you're all right. He knows everything about us, our thoughts, our future. Before we were ever born, and knows where we will spend eternity somewhere. And he wants us to know him. To know him is eternal life. In the way he intended, in the way that we can. How is that possible? To know somebody you've never seen, talked to, heard the voice. <coughs> I've already read those verses. Those scriptures cannot be broken. It's true. How many people do you know in all the years you've been here? Now, you can know people in different ways. I, you know, working up the Federal Center, they had quite a workforce up there. Man in the heyday was real close to 2,000 when I was there. It downsized a little bit. It's probably still over 1,000, I would imagine. And I worked up in that building for 34 years. And I got to admit, there were a lot of people that I saw, not necessarily every day because it was a big building, different offices, but in passing, in a hallway, you know, in the cafeteria or whatever, you get to know some people that you know by face. Some you know by face and by name. Some you are a lot closer with because you actually work side by side or in the same office. So you get to know about their family, you know, their husband, their wife, or whatever, their kids, or maybe some of the things that they're going through as, fam as people. You know, uh, we've all had mothers or fathers or relatives, uh, neighbors, people you know. You say you know. I know that guy. I would submit to you, you don't really know anybody, and sometimes you don't even know yourself. <laughs> Easy. The apostles, you know, Jesus said, when he betrayed me, oh, you know, this, that, you know. You know, we're ready to go to prison, even to death uh, for you. Jesus told Peter, you lot, you're going to deny. Before this night's over, three times, you don't, e you don't even know who I am. No way. They were pretty confident. It said that they all said the same thing. They really, really thought they were ready for this not. They found out. No, they weren't. They were so sure what they would do. Boy, they were surprised. Sometimes you don't even know your own self. Not like God knows you and me. You know, when Peter says it's necessary, you have to go through trials for the, the testing of the genuineness of your faith. Because if you're being tested, if something's being tested, it's because it needs to be, because there has to be a result of the test to give you information of what it is you're testing. You know, it's like in school when kids get, have to take a test because the teacher wants to know, are they getting this? 
And testing, taking a test after they've been through all the information with you, will show them, are you getting it? Now, if one or two aren't getting it, it might be their fault because they don't pay attention or they, they could care less or something. But if a teacher saw that 80% of the students in the classroom weren't getting it, the teacher has to start to think, hmm, it must, I'm not communicating this or something. They're not getting it. Testing is necessary. But in the context of us being tested in our faith, and there's a result to that test because you will see the outcome. You'll see the result of the test that you go through this fiery trial. Who's that information for? Do you think it's for God to see how you're doing? <laughs> he already knows. He wants you to know because, like I said, you might not know yourself. You think you're where you're supposed to be, and after the smoke clears in your little fiery trial, and you realize, man, I sure blew that. Surprise! It wasn't a surprise to God. That information's for you, so you can take corrective action. Corrective action. Because he knows us. He knows us. But if you think that you know other people, really? I know, maybe some of us experienced finding out. We thought we knew somebody. We didn't know them at all. What they present on the outward is not who they are on the inward, unfortunately. But it's not a surprise either because all of us coming out of darkness to the light, going through a process of change, that is a journey. Many of us have been ashamed of who we are on the inside. You would never want anyone to know who you really were. And you don't want to be found out. But God still knows who you are. But guess what? He knows the potential for all of us because he created us. And that's why he can forgive us and work with us. Because he doesn't intend to leave you in that darkness. That's why he calls us out to the light. And then we have to go through a morphosis, metamorphosis of change because he's actually transforming us into his likeness. In the likeness of the Son, which is the same thing. If you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen the Father. And those whom God foreknew, you know, Romans 8 and 29, he predestined they would be conformed to the image, character of his Son, that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn of many just like him. That's why God can be so patient with us, because we have that potential. To, he wants us to know him, who he really is, and the way he intended, and his son, that we are capable of, so he can be patient. You know, you've known your kids growing up, and you realize they're really struggling, but you see their potential, so you hang in there with them. You don't try to destroy your child with discipline. It's training, the idea of it, training, so they can put off concerning some of that former conduct, that old behavior, the old man, be renewed in the spirit of their mind as they put on a new man, created according to God. True righteousness and holiness. Man, that's our potential. And if we know him, that's exactly, know him the way he intended, I mean. Not just, oh, yeah, I know God. People say they know people. They don't know people. Probably the closest that two people could actually really kind of know is marriage and years of it. But sometimes people, after years of marriage, they find out they ain't the person I thought I was marrying. Where I'm going with this, you're going to find out the way this scripture is designed, the one, I hate to say person, entity, that you can know, and the only one you can really know is God by design. This scriptures, these scriptures are designed to produce that. Because what you think 
you know about other people, you may find out what isn't true. Everything this scripture says about God, because you have thousands of examples. Remember, we tend to look on the outward with people because you really don't know their inward man. But God exposes himself to us. You can see who he is in one physical sense of the creation itself, testifies of his glory and his power, his eternal power and Godhead by the creation of things that are made. Psalms 19 says all that is actually a language. It's communication of God to his creation, of his existence by the things that are made. And by revelation of scripture, you can know who he is and everything you could wonder about him. He's not hidden in the darkness any longer. When he sent his son, who is a light, into this world, so we didn't have to be in that darkness no more, there's nothing hidden anymore about who he is and what he likes and what he don't like. From the time of the creation, when God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the green things, the critters, and all that stuff, he said it was good. David said, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're good. I mean, what God has done is good. The creation is good. It declares his glory. Let me just run down real quick here. We'll grab some psalms. Pay attention when you see these. Now, I mean, they're all over the place, and I have no way we are going to be... I just want to point it out. Everything the Bible says about God, think about what it's revealing to you about who he is. I'm just going to grab a few here. I'm going to go to uh, Psalms 146. Pick a spot here. Uh, verse 5 through 9. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who keeps truth forever and executes justice for the oppressed he gives food to the hungry and the lord gives freedom to prisoners the lord opens the eyes of the blind god raises those who are bowed down the lord loves righteousness he watches over strangers he relieves fatherless and widow he's good what i'm saying is pay attention those are not just idle words it's explaining to you the character remember Father, that they know you. This is who he is. This is who he is. He is the creator. He does keep truth forever. That's nice. He executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. Well, that's nice. That's who he is. He gives freedom to prisoners. He opens the eyes of the blind. It's telling you who he is. Remember how John, 1 John talks about God is light and in him no darkness. That's not clinical facts. That's who he is. He is light. He is truth. Jesus said he is good and ungood but God says his mercy, we'll see a verse on that here, abides forever. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. That's true too. I'm looking back across the page here to Psalms 145. 145, verse 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious. That's a fact. He is full of compassion. He's slow to anger. And great in mercy. This is your God. This is the one that we're supposed to know. This is not just facts. So we pack a, pass a test, a written exam. He wants you to know that's who you're dealing with. Who knows you. He knows everything that there is to know about you. 
And the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. I'm just, just grabbing just the little quick snippets. This thing is loaded. Remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What do you think you're going to see when you read every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? You're going to find out who he is, is what you're going to find out. And it's trustworthy because Jesus said scripture cannot be broken and his word is truth. And what I would submit to you, this is explaining to you the unseen God that no one has ever physically seen and hasn't heard his voice. But because, as I already said, you know a lot of people. You know yourself, supposedly, right? And I just brought out, no, you don't. You don't know nobody. You're looking on the outward. You have no such information about any other person you know anywhere on this whole world that is absolutely true concerning them because you don't have all the facts. You can't possibly know. You look on the outward, you get a pretty good idea, you can work with people, you can be friends, you can do a whole lot of things. I'm not saying, now don't forget Jeremiah 17 and 9 said the heart is deceitful above all, desperately wicked, who can know it? That's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with humans. Now the only person wearing skin that was the real McCoy was the son of God. But guess how far he's taking us? That our yea would be yea, and our nay, nay. That what people saw when they saw us was the real deal. But hey, let's. <laughs> there was a whole lot of people that saw Jesus of Nazareth and said, a blasphemer. Demon possessed, deceiver, kill him. I don't care what you might attain to as we are to know God the way he truly is and to know him the way he intended and what we are capable of. Don't expect people to necessarily see you that way. If they didn't see him that way, they ain't going to see you that way. Don't worry about it. Paul said, small thing for me to be judged by you. He said, I don't even judge myself. I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 4. He said, it's the Lord who judges me. Judge nothing until the time, he says. Then it will be manifested. So don't misunderstand. We are to be conformed into the very likeness of his son through this process true and we want that because you'll have no better relationship with nobody else on this planet than another person walking in the spirit of Christ who's died to self but is alive to God born again walking in newness of life putting off the old putting on the new man that's somebody you want to be like and know other people just like it but my point is today, you can know God that way because these scriptures weren't written about you. They're written about him so we could know him because we haven't seen him. I'm just still sampling here. I'm just looking at Psalms 103. Verse 8 said, the Lord is merciful. That's true. He's gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. And he hasn't dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquity. True. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his, his mercy to, to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our transgression from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame and remembers we are just dust. Uh, 
Verse 17 said, The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and those who remember his commandments to do them. It just goes on and on and on. You start to realize if you keep reading your scriptures through from literally Genesis to Revelation, halfway regular basis, you know, just working through it for the rest of your life, why not? You're going to know everything there is to know about the Creator. Personally. One, not just facts about him, but you start to know his heart. That's the point. I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. His heart. How many people do you really think you know that? Yet you can know the unseen God, the creator of the entire, everything you could even imagine. That is amazing when you really realize you can know who he is. You'll know what he likes, dislikes. You know how he's worked with you, how patient he is, how kind he's merciful. He can get angry, he chastises, he disciplines, but it doesn't uh, endure. That's not his strong point. His anger. He, we know he's not willing that any should perish, according to Ezekiel 18. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want him to turn and live. That's his attitude. That's his heart. He didn't want to destroy people. Not willing. Second Peter 3 said, He ain't willing anybody should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Come to repentance. That's who he is. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He loves, he loved, God so loved, he gave his only begotten son. He loved, God so loved the world. He wanted to perish. That's who he is. Romans 5 says, Christ died. God demonstrated his love when Christ died for us when we were sinners. Yet when we were still sinners. He said, who would do that? Perhaps someone would die for a righteous man or a godly man, but who the heck would die for some sinner? God. That's who we're dealing with. See, these scriptures, Jesus said in John 10, 35, can't be broken. The word of the Lord will endure forever. This is the word. These scriptures cannot be broken. They are all true. That's who he is. You cannot possibly know anyone else with any real assurance when you're looking on the outward and getting some idea from things that they do. But you really don't know anybody. Not like you can know God of all people. You would think he's the one that nobody could know. Have you ever thought about him so close? Most people think God is a God afar off. Dwells under the cover of the darkness. When he literally not only wrote all this information down about himself, so we could know him, he literally put on skin, parachuted down here, and brought it, hand-delivered it personally, and then hung around, walking around down here. Now, granted, he was here for a whole lot of years, and people wouldn't have known who he was, except the people, his neighbors. But he was the same guy before his revealing at the Jordan River. He always was who he was. It just didn't become apparent officially that he was the Lamb of God to come to take away the sin of the world. Then you could watch him in action. Then all that teaching he tells us about turning the cheek, going the extra mile, you know, loving your enemies and doing good to people that hate you and all this blah, blah, blah. Isn't that the life he lived? Yes, he did. When reviled, didn't revile in return. See? Committed himself to him who judges righteously. Everything he's called us to do, he came, he did it. Because that's who he is. And that's what he wants us to be. 
then you would think he's the one that nobody could know. Well, I'll tell you what, they didn't know him until this, until, until you get, here it is. You're not going to know this about God intuitively. Because there's too many people out here that think they know who God is. And so they act that way and say, well, God knows me. You know, me and God got a deal. You know, me and God, we're working this out. Yeah, right. No, you don't know him. This is the only way you can know who he is. And it is the truth. You can know him perfectly. That's the way he intended for people to know him and made us capable of knowing him that way. That will result in your everlasting life with him. Don't misunderstand. That includes you coming to this knowledge as you see his plan for your redemption through his son about you know repenting and confessing being born of water and spirit all that's all part of it of which we gladly do to know him and have him a part of our lives daily through the trials which are tremendous down here And again, it came down here in the flesh to hand to the, deliver the document. <laughs> Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because he is exactly the same way. Because they are, I and my Father are one. And he adopts us into his family, joint heirs with his son. Well, you can't get more personal than that. That's our God. And we can know him that way. Thank you for your attention this morning.